Hey guys, today we're in Colossians chapter 3. We're going to be in verses 20 and 21. The overall context of chapter 3, obviously we've spoken about it before, is that Paul is talking about what the new life in Christ looks like as Christ begins to be formed in us in our sanctification through the Spirit and the Word. Um, and in this section that started in verse 18, Paul's addressing Christian families. So 18 and 19 addressed the relationship between the husband and the wife. How the husband and the wife, that relationship between them, is to image and model the relationship between Christ and his church. And now in verse 20 and 21, he, Paul's addressing the relationship between uh, Christian parents and their children. And so in verse 20, he says, Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. And then in verse 21, he says, fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Okay. And so when addressing children, um, Paul says, obey your parents in everything for this pleases the Lord. We remember that is the goal of the Christian life, right? To please the Lord. In, in chapter one, Paul had told the Colossians, since the day that we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, we've not ceased to pray for you, asking that you would be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. This is our goal as believers, to live our lives in a way that is worthy of our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave everything for us, and to be fully pleasing to God the Father. And so he's telling children, this is how you do that. You fully please the Lord through living in obedience to your Christian parents, okay? What does this mean, obey? Well, obey means to submit to, to be in subjection to, to live in submission under, um, to be obedient to, okay, to your mother and father. And so this is speaking of children in the context of still being young, living under your parents' authority in your parents' household. You haven't grown up yet. You haven't taken on a spouse of your own and you haven't started your own family. You are still under the authority of your parents, okay? And Jesus was the perfect model for this. We know um, when the story of Jesus when he was 12 years old and he traveled to Jerusalem uh, for the Passover with his parents. They spent the Passover in Jerusalem. Um, when Passover was over, they, uh, the family all left. They didn't realize Jesus wasn't with them. They had already traveled a whole day's journey before they finally realized Jesus wasn't with them. They went back to Jerusalem, looked all over, finally found him. Um, they had the little interaction right there. And it says that Jesus went with them and was subject to them, okay? And so even God, the son, um, when he incarnated into human flesh on this earth, and when he was still a child, when he was under the authority of his mother and father, he um, willingly made himself subject and in submission to them. He was obedient to his earthly mother and father. In every way, Jesus modeled um, the, the life of faith in Christ or in the father. Um, he modeled the Christian life basically for us and how to walk in righteousness and holiness toward God. Okay. And so, um, this is what that means. As a Christian child, as a child, I am to respect the authority that God has placed over me and my mother and my father. I'm to appreciate the love that they have for me, the sacrifices that they make for me. And, and our parents do. Um, they carry the weight of the world for us. You know, as a father, I don't want my kids to have to feel the weight and responsibility of living on this earth and being an adult. I mean, it is, it is hard. It's painful. Um, it's difficult at times. And I don't want my kids to have to feel that until they're at a point that they're able to bear it. Okay. And so as kids, a lot of times we don't realize everything that our parents do to us so that they take the burden so that we don't have to feel it. Right. And so it's easy to, for us as kids to take them for granted. And, 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 and yet our job is to understand and to try to realize and appreciate everything they do for us, to appreciate the love that they show us and to return that through being obedient, being submission to them and to try our best to grow up into good, responsible adults ourselves. Okay, this reminds me of this relationship between father and mother. This reminds me of the fifth commandment. It says, honor your father and mother that it may be well with you that you may live long on the earth, okay? Um, Paul in Ephesians actually tied these two things together, the fifth commandment with his, uh, his command to be obedient, uh, children to be obedient to their parents. In, in, um, in Ephesians uh, chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, Paul says, Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. And then he goes into the commandment. He said, Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. 
Okay, and so honoring our father and mother is something that God has commanded us from the beginning. He's commanded children, honor your father and mother. It's something that goes far beyond childhood, goes into adulthood and all lives, all our lives, um, all of our lives, we are to honor our father and mother. Because we're children, it's in obedience to them, in submission to them. Um, but but it goes beyond that, okay? Um, to honor someone means to 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 treat them with special significance, okay? Um, so they're not just like everyone else. They're not just some people in the world and I just happen to have them know this is my mother and my father and I will love them and I will honor them and I will respect them all of the days of my life, whether they're here on this earth or whether they go to be with the Lord before me, I'm going to honor my father and mother. That is a command of God. We honor them as children through obedience, but it continues through our life um, from child childhood into adulthood with loyalty. Okay, and loyalty is not just I'm going to take their side even if they're wrong. Um, no, I mean, um, it means more like um, being loyal to them, speaking well of them, even when they're not around, speaking well of them and to them when they are around, speaking well of them even when they aren't around. Um, if you have good parents on this earth, then there's literally no one on this earth who will ever love you more selflessly, more sacrificially than your own mom and dad. Okay, and, and granted, you're gonna have other people, you know, uh, God willing in your life that will love you selflessly um, and deeply. Your spouse may be one of them. Your children probably will be one of them, right? But my point is that no one's gonna love you more deeply, more sacrificially, more selflessly than your own mom and dad. They would lay down their own life for you because of their love for you. And so our job as children is to return the favor to them through faithfulness, through loyalty to them, through love for them, okay? Um, and there may come a time in our life um, where this, uh, the other way that we may um, honor them is through caring for them. There may come a time in their life when they become weak or frail. They might even forget who they are or they might forget who we are, okay? But at that point in our life, it becomes our privilege and our honor to return that same love and care that they had for us, you know, sacrificing for them just as they did for us when we were children. Um, that is our way of honoring our father and our mother. Okay, so children, obey your parents and everything for this pleases the Lord. And then he says fathers, okay? He's addressing the head of the household, the head of the family. But this doesn't only apply to fathers. We know that we have single mothers, single fathers, we have nuclear families. But in every way, when it comes to raising children, this applies to all of us. He says, fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. And so this verse really has to do with being our children's greatest encouragers, okay? So we're not to be our child's greatest discourager. It's not that we're never to correct them. It's not that we're never to discipline them, okay? But that we're not to be our child's discourager, okay? Um, he says, don't provoke your children. There's a couple ways I think that parents do this. One of them is through teasing and bullying. And it may start in their childhood. They may be a little kid and they try to stand up and dad pushes them down. Stand up, push them down. Stand up, push them down. And they start to get frustrated and dad laughs and they're, oh, they're so frustrated they can't do anything about it because you're bigger and stronger and more powerful and you just overpower them. Maybe you offer them a cookie or a toy and they reach for it and you pull it away <laughs> and you laugh about it. It's so funny. That's not funny. You're a bully. You're a bully of your own child, you know? And your kid's gonna play, gonna face a million bullies in your life, in their life, and you should never, ever, ever be one of them. But that could continue on into teen years, right? Maybe they start to, you know, try to figure out what it means to, to, to be their own person, and so they're pulled away from you a little bit. Maybe they're standing on their own feet. They're not wanting to be around you quite as much. Maybe they think they're a little too cool, and it kind of rubs you the wrong way. And so we take it upon ourselves to kind of knock them down a peg. Every time we see them, we're making fun of them, making their own little jabs, making them feel bad. Maybe we try to embarrass them in front of our, their friends. Okay, again, your child is going to face plenty of bullies, plenty of tyrants in their life, but their mom and their dad should not ever, ever, ever be one of them. Okay, it's not that we shouldn't correct them. It's not that we shouldn't point out, hey, your attitude's a little bad. It's not that we shouldn't discipline even. But what we should never do is be their bully. We should be our child's greatest advocate. That they would know that even if they just royally blow it, they completely mess up everything in their life and it's in shambles, that I can always go to dad. I can always go to mom and I can just tell them what happened and, and they're not gonna, they might not be happy about it, right? 
but I know my parents love me and they're for me and they're going to pick me up. And they're going to dust me off and they're going to hug me and set me back on my feet and help me to get back on track in my life. We want to be a safe place for our children, not their bullies. Okay. Another way that we can provoke our children is through placing unreasonable expectations on our kids. Okay. And this could be in form of grades, um, sports, um, art, music, achievement, or even success later in life. And, and it's funny because some some parents want to live vicariously through their kids. It's like you, you didn't, you know, make it in the big leagues. And so you want your son to, you didn't make it in uh, on Broadway. And so you want your child to, to, and maybe you're the angry little league dad who, if your child gets up and swings and misses and strikes out at the plate, you're, you're yelling and cussing and making a big scene and screaming at the coach. You know, maybe you need to grow up and maybe you're the helicopter theater mom because you didn't make it on Broadway. You're going to make sure your son does. Okay. That he's going to make it. And, and so you're, you know, And the thing is about this is that our motivation is 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 usually good, right? I mean, I want my kids to be better than me. I, I really do. I want them to be smarter than me. I want them to be more successful than I am. I want them to be um, um, more wealthy than I am. I want their life to go well. Um, I want them to love Jesus more than I do. I want them to be more faithful to him than I am. I want them to follow him and trust him more than I have in my life. And, and you know, also we want them to avoid pain. Like we might've made mistakes in our own life and blown up our own life at points in our own lives. We've, we've made bad choices and it cost us something and we don't want to see our kids go through that again. And so we place these really high unreasonable expectations on them because we don't want them to feel pain. We don't want them to, to mess up or implode their lives. But there's a couple things that I want to consider here. Okay. And the first one is our kids are just not us. Okay. We may want them to be us. They may look like us. Um, they may talk like us, but our kids are not us. They have different gifts and callings and, and, and personalities and opportunities. And guess what? They have a different set of parents even than, than we did. And, and, and so you may have been great at math or at spelling or at sports, um, at motocross, you know, you were an awesome football player, um, but your kid's not you. You might be an extrovert and you're great with people. Maybe you're a great public speaker. Maybe you are an amazing golfer, okay? But, but your child is not you. God has made them unique. He's made them with different gifts. He's made them with different callings. He's made them with different personalities. And so our job is not to make our child into the best us that we can. Our job is not to make them fulfill all the dreams that we never could. Our job is to help our child to become the greatest them, the best them that God always envisioned when he was forming them in their mother's womb. Okay. Here's another thing to consider. We weren't perfect either, and we still aren't, okay? Did you never get a B? Did you never strike out? Did you never drop the ball? Did you never forget your line? Of course you have, and so have I. The fact is, we've all done these things because we're not perfect, and neither are our children. But when your child feels like no matter what they do, no matter how hard they try, no matter how close they come, that they can never be good enough for you, because you're always going to find some Thing to be critical. You're always going to correct them. You're always going to try to try to knock them back down a peg when no matter what they do feels like it's ever going to be good enough for them. It doesn't make them feel encouraged to try harder, to try again. It makes them want to give up. Okay. And so our job as parents is not to be our child's greatest discourager. Our job is to be their greatest encourager. And when they fall in life, either physically or metaphorically, our job is to help to pick them up, to dust them off, to hug them fiercely, give them a big old kiss on the forehead, and to point them back toward the goal. And another thing, the goal is not wealth, and it's not fame, and it's not achievement, it's not success. The goal is always Christ. Okay, and the last thing I want to say here is this. In, in, in Colossians chapter 4, verse 1, he's talking to masters and bond servants, but he says, Masters, um, treat your bond servants justly, um, remembering that you also have a, a master. Okay. And, and this is talking to, speaking to authority. Okay. Um, as parents, we have authority over our children. And anyone that has authority over someone else always needs to remember um, that, that yes, we have this authority, but there's someone higher than us as well. There's someone greater than us. There's someone over us. There's someone that has authority over us as well. And, and that person, okay, we may be a mother or a father, but we also have a father in heaven. And our father loves us more deeply than we can ever comprehend. Um, 
He is more intimately concerned with your well-being, with your choices, with your destiny in the course of your life than you could ever be with your own child. Remember that. Our Father desires His children to love Him and obey Him and walk in obedience toward Him, um, just as He deserves for us all to do. He has provided for us everything we've needed over the courses of our entire lives. He's given us everything we need for guidance so that we would never fall and we would never fail. And yet, guess what? We do fall and we do fail. And yet when we do, he, he doesn't condemn us. He loves us. He lifts us up. He forgives us. He's merciful. And he points us back toward the goal. Our Father in heaven is more patient and more gentle and more kind and more merciful to us than we deserve. And so when we're tempted as parents to place unrealistic expectations on our children, um, when we're tempted to become critical or harsh of them, to tease them or bully them or frustrate them to the point that they become discouraged, we do very well to remember how often we ourselves fall short, how often we fail, and how when we do, our loving Heavenly Father picks us up, dusts us off, um, cleanses us with the blood of Jesus and helps us to, to get right back on his path toward his goal to become the people he always desired for us to be. When, when, when we want to know how to parent our children, we only need to look to our Father in heaven to see how he parents us.